Hello. Good afternoon. Uh, this paper presents some of my research as a Jackman Fellow, part of my research that unites my work as a rural historian and as a historian of energy. The paper is a re-examination of Canada's rural clearances, as I'm calling it, that period after the Second World War, when the rural population first plummeted as intensive industrial farming replaced earlier organic rural practices, and as Canada became urban, industrial, and modern. Writing at a time when the catastrophic consequences of fossil fuel burning which is now, can no longer be ignored. How does this new perspective influence our earlier evaluation of this country's decision in the 1940s to overcome considerable rural resistance in order to embrace fossil fuels and the global political and industri industrial economy that it uh, created? I'm going to share my screen now. Okay. Historians have paid considerable attention to the rural protest movements that in Canada, as in so many countries around the world, first accompanied the rapid rise of urban industrialization in the 1910 to 1925 period, documenting and analyzing in some detail the rise and the fall of political populist United Farmers uh, parties, both at the provincial and at the federal level in Canada. Less well known, however, is the wide range of grassroots uh, rural protest movements that gained strength in the 1930 to the 1960 period. Historians, commentators, and many rural people themselves eventually came to see rural populations, uh, rural depopulation, sorry, as inevitable, even essential, uh, an essential component of uh, modernity and progress. And protests against these changes were increasingly seen as atavistic, nostalgic, and irrelevant. But rural people were still hotly debated, debating the advisability of those changes throughout the entire 1930 to 1960 period uh, and using a variety of vibrant protest initiatives to do so. This paper focuses on the economic and political context of the reform movements that accompanied the Canadian clearances, and as well on the critiques of and the alternatives to the modern urban and industrial society. And I'll look at those from two historical vantage points. The paper begins by outlining rural Canada's distinctive political economy in the pre and proto industrial periods, that is before the 1930s, that was comprised of occupational pluralism and farming as small holding. That, both of these continued to characterize rural Canada until the Second World War. The paper then goes on to provide a brief overview of the increasing threats to this way of life, the political movements that resulted, and the eventual failure of these rural protest movements to stem the changes that, as critics had predicted, resulted in rapid and precipitous rural depopulation, all premised, of course, on the kind of massive fossil fuel consumption um, that powers Canada today. Immigration to Canada in the 19th and 20th centuries marked the tail end of a remarkable 250-year period dubbed the Great Land Rush by John, historian John Weaver. It was one of the few eras in human history when poor people, as long as they were not Indigenous people whose unceded lands were appropriated to facilitate col colonialism, um, the poor people had the ability, though always con contingent on their wealth, health, luck, and or the skill to realize it, to own enough land to support themselves and their families in a way that left them free from the despotic economic control of landlords, of employers, or, mon or monarchs uh, bent on financing war and later industrialization through high taxes on peasants. As history of historians of colonization and indigenous dispossession have emphasized, land ownership conferred political as well as economic power. As independent commodity producers, Canadian settler families were acutely interested in policies affecting rural production, distribution, and markets. Millions of relatively poor, small-scale farmers and other rural dwellers were transformed in Canada into important political actors who quickly learned to add their voices and their interests to those of business owners and increasingly the industrialists who were vying for power within the growing Canadian state. 
Canada remained a vibrant rural country um, well, uh, well into Canada's um, industrial period. The number of farm households in Canada continued to grow well into the 20th century, peaking in 1941, as this graph uh, shows, with about twice as many farms as in 1871. The number of ac acres being farmed continued to grow until 1971, showing a six-fold increase over 100 years. The rural population of Canada grew continually in the century after 1871, more than doubling from 3 million to about 7.5 million in 1971. It fell for the first time ever in 1976. Official census uh, statistics tend to understate the country's persistent rural uh, character. While Canada's official urban population first exceeded its, its rural for the first time, as this graph shows, in 1921, uh, if the statistics are looked at in another way, it was not until 1941 that for the first time more Canadians, a scant 51%, uh, lived in communities larger than 1,000 people. So most people don't consider that to be um, urban if you live somewhere that's as 1,000 people or more, but the the um, that was considered uh, urban by the, by Statistics Canada. It wasn't until until 1961, remarkably, that more people, 51%, lived in communities larger than 5,000 people in Canada. Canada continued to be a rural place, rural and very small town place, and Canadians are rural people until the mid 20th century and beyond. But as citizens and sojourners in a rural country, Canadians were not always rural in the same way that rural peoples were in other colonized countries. The promise of arable lands first drew uh, Europeans to what uh, geographer Cole Harris termed this reluctant land, principally so that they could support themselves by agricultural production on, on the family farm. But far vaster than arable lands in Canada are the expansive, uh, expanses of land inhospitable to or only intermittently hospitable to commercial agriculture because of our long cold winters, a short growing season, vast distances, and or poor or even non-existent topsoil. Fortunately for the millions of settlers seeking independence on their own rural lands in 19th and early 20th century Canada, even if rural environments were only marginally suited for agriculture, they provided a wealth of, of resources, as Indigenous people had long known, um, that could uh, be utilized in other ways to support rural households and rural communities. Canadian rural households were supported by three strong economic pillars. First, the sale or barter of commodities that they harvested and sold from their own lands. Secondly, the sale of their labor and also their animals' labor, particularly horses and oxen, and, <clears throat> and particularly in the burgeoning resource economies of the early 20th century, including um, mining and, and logging and fishing. And thirdly, they could support themselves directly from the land and waters through um, self-provisioning provisioning activities, hunting, gardening, fishing, all, uh, that all household members would participate in. Well into the 20th century, rural Canadians shared a distinctive household-based political economy that included men, women, and children, and ranged over a spectrum of economic activities, varying from complete reliance on wage labor at one extreme to complete reliance on household self-provisioning subsistence on the other, and including the production, tending, and harvesting of animals and plants, including trees for fuel and as commodities for sale. The particular components of that economy shifted according to the family's um, life cycle, how old were the children, how old were elderly parents, um, according to local environments, according to the seasons, and according to both uh, global and local markets. Neither traditional nor modern, neither fully capitalist nor fully peasant, the rural population of Canada was still in 1941 a distinctive element of the Canadian social, political and economic fabric that differed, that differed in specific ways from urban and industrial milieu that was growing up um, across the country. Census data from 1941 confirms that 60% of rural people 
uh, sorry, that fewer than 60% of rural people were in fact classified as farmers. And most farmers were not full-time farmers in the sense of making a, com a commercially successful living from the sale of agricultural commodities. As this slide shows, the most numerous kind of farm in Canada was in fact called subsistence or a combination of subsistence and other goods. Occupational pluralism and the flexibility and variations that this implied defined rural life. Support for farmers, political parties and rural reform surged across Canada, as I mentioned, in the first two decades of the 20th century as conflict between agricultural and other, uh, other interests dominated politics across Canada. Farmers argued that without government support of agriculture through provision of cheap land, low tariffs of, of the machinery that they needed to produce their crops and their cooperative control over the transportation and the marketing as well as the production of their of their produce without that agricultural interest would suffer relative to the non-producers the business and industry who could profit at the expense of farmers they also worried that large that large capital intensive operations would push the average small-scale farmer out of a living and out of rural life farmers saw uh, popular political control, and they wanted to protect their families, their communities, and way of life from corporate hegemony, even as they often use business methods themselves to preserve the traditional values and lifestyles of, of the family farm. For in spite of rapid change in the early 20th century, re many reformers believed Canada's future would continue to be rural, predominantly agricultural, and probably based on cooperative values and practices of collective action for the people, rather than towards a support of big business and isolated individualism. By the late 1920s, however, mass political support was faltering for a variety of reasons, including the growth of rural and urban populations. While the number of farm households peaked in Canada in 1941 and the rural population continued to ri uh, rise, the family farm was not thriving. With overproduction, um, so the rural populations were still growing, the farm population was, was falling, began to fall. With overproduction driving down prices in global markets and threatening farm incomes, with big business taking what farmers considered an unreasonable portion of the profits, and with urban industrialization providing what many rural people understood as an unworkable model of the future of Canadian communities, the typical small-scale farm was increasingly caught in the price-cost squeeze, in which the spiraling cost of producing food was simply not matched by increased sale prices, inequality between rural and urban group. Even as organized political support faltered by the mid-20th century, as has the interest of historians in rural Canada after that period, rural people nevertheless continued to press for solutions to their problems which farm and government organizations were either unable or unwilling to give and tried to take matters into their own hands. Protests against the increasing poverty and isolation being imposed by industrial farming and a fight for the kinds of cooperative communities, small-scale agriculture, and occupational pluralism they sought to maintain took new forms in the face of government inaction. Influenced by rural social and educational movements in Britain, um, Europe, and Sweden, rural Canadians responded in the 1930 to 45 period with a remarkable number and variety of organizations to deal with a newly emerging problem of modern rural life. These included the uh, perhaps the most famous of, of all, the anti ganish movement, the Francis Xavier movement, the New Canada movement, the Folk Schools Community Life Conferences, the Working Men's Educational Associations, Agricola Study Groups, the United Farmers of Ontario Projects, and, um, and the Farm CBC Farm Radio Forum. A number of rural adult education organizations had by the 1930s already begun to, to make use of the new medium of the radio to create radio listening groups to promote greater understanding of rural social issues in the hope of encouraging social and socialist activism. These included farmers, the Farmers University of the Air, the Community Clinics, the Farm Problem Series, the Inquiry into co and the Inquiry into, into Cooperation. In 1940, the highly successful Adult Education and Social Activist Movement, the CBC National Farm Radio Forum, was launched and, and played its um, weekly broadcasts and 
weekly until 19, um, weekly throughout the, the fall and winter until 1965. But as Canada, as a, the Canadian Federation of Agriculture representative Donald Cameron noted in his annual address to the Canadian Association of Adult Education in 1940, the rural dwellers of Canada comprise one third of the population and provide one half of the national wealth and receive one twelfth of the national income. A variety of federally and provincially funded programs in the 1930 to 1965 period began responding to increasing rural poverty. The Canadian Federation of Agriculture was created in the mid 1930s to deal with the growing recognition that the pressing problems of farming now are those connected with marketing, distribution, farm incomes and social organization. It spearheaded a variety of community based initiatives. The Prairie Farm Rehabilitation Act of the 1930s remediated some of the devastation from the droughts and mismanagement of the Great Depression. The Maritime Marshland Rehabilitation Act started in um, the 1940s as a way of protecting agricultural lands from saltwater flooding in the Fundy region of New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. A nationwide program, the Agricultural Rehabilitation and Development Act, known as ARDA, was created in 1960 to provide federal partnerships with the purpose of, quote, facilitating the economic adjustment of rural areas and of increasing their income and employment opportunities by improving the use and productivity of resources in rural areas, unquote. Funding began in 1963 for such projects as community pastures, farm dugouts, steam control dams, flood control, marsh draining, and irrigation. It also provided funds to move tens of thousands of farmers off lands um, deemed unsuitable for farming. That was particularly the case from, um, from uh, southern Alberta and Saskatchewan. In the second half of the 20th century, uh, it was increasingly, however, the small scale, non specialist nature of ca Canadian farming and rural life, and not problems with government policies or lack thereof in supporting people appropriately on the land that were increasingly being targeted by economists as the real causes of rural poverty. Economists had argued that farms must compete in global markets if they were to thrive nationally. Increased efficiency would have to be manifested at the level of the individual farmer, mainly through increased use of machinery, pesticides, fertilizers, and increased size of farms, where appropriate and competitive economies of scale could do their rightful work in managing the local and the national economy. As one economist explained in 1950, 40 acres in a mule is no longer an economic production unit. 16 acres of cropland per worker no longer represents a competitive workload. $1,000 a year is too little money. Tractor power has reduced mule power. Mechanization and consolidation might obviate the necessity of replacing many of the present antiquated farm structures. Most farm households in Canada, unfortunately, lacked both the knowledge to understand the new scientific farming or sufficient volume to justify purchasing the farm equipment needed to achieve the economies of scale to be competitive in a global market. As one rural economist put it, the farmer is in the awkward position where he can neither afford to own the machines nor to do without them. As another observed, farm consolidation, modernization and mechanization offer an economic solution to the problem of the land but, as the economist poignantly asked, what is the solution for the people? If the key to efficient agriculture was planning, and the key to planning was the systematic contraction of production in line with restricted demand, economists worried that too many Canadian farmers were outside the disciplinary structures of the market system to guarantee the smooth functioning of the capitalist markets. In a country firmly devoted to free market ideology and reluctant to impose the kind of legislation um, governing land use that was widely being adopted in, in Europe in the immediate post-World War II period, Preventing the kind of overproduction and falling prices that might result in yet another worldwide depression meant bringing all agricultural producers within, within the orbit of capitalist relations, where they could respond rationally to the market forces. 
Canada's typical farm household, where land ownership, self-provisioning, and occupational pluralism provided it relative protection from market forces, were simply not responsive enough. By the late 1960s, earlier programs that had been designed to keep people in rural communities uh, were being accused of actually increasing rural poverty by interfering with the smooth functioning of markets. As the 1967 National Report on Rural Poverty argued, poverty was basically a problem of national economic efficiency, and the report cautioned that if groups of people do not produce and consume as much of as society's as much of society's technical know-how will permit, the material progress must slow down for all. Traditional forms of small-scale farming in Canada simply did not fit, it concluded, with uh, well into, did not fit well into the requirements of modern society. Demand for food tends to rise more slowly, the economists explain, than the technical ability to produce it, and resources devoted to its production become redundant. The resulting price-cost squeeze is a signal through the market mechanism that a reallocation and the use of labor, capital, and land is necessary. Their findings suggested that attempts to improve land use through the development of agricultural soil and water resources, quote, cannot effectively serve the most pressing needs of the modern era, unquote. The report outlined three possible responses to the imperatives of the market as manifested in the price cost squeeze. Farmers had the choice of first, they could scale up their operations and a declining, declining number of farms could specialize and compete internationally. A second and related option, and one actively encouraged in the report, uh, was for non-competitive farmers to move off the land and into the city where their labor could rationally be utilized in a growing urban economy. The third option, and one which the authors of the study puzzled about throughout, was for rural dwellers to stay on their land in, in increasing poverty. The problem indeed with the government programs, as we saw earlier, was that by offering certain minor kinds of assistance, but providing neither the encouragement to leave, nor the means to substantially improve scale and efficiency, these farm programs played a part in prolonging undesirable farm situations. The small addition to farm income and uh, that Arda promises uh, could have influenced some farmers to postpone or reject potentially better off-farm solutions. Nevertheless, the report lamented, quote, that despite the adjustments demanded by modern markets, the fact is that a great many small farms have neither expanded nor disappeared. Unquote. The report calculated that for every 20 low-income farms in 1951, eight had passed out of existence by the 1961 census, one out of the 20 had become larger, but 11 were present still. These low-income farms remain in all parts of the country. While the authors puzzled over the irrationality and barriers to movement that prevented farmers from getting big or getting out, people remaining in rural Canada continued to voice their opposition to an economy and a society that they believed was forcing them off the land. The flexibility of, of rural life melted away as incomes rose. As rural populations declined under the force of increasing competition, rural communities began their final collapse. The year-round roads and cheap fuels that facilitated the transportation of commodities off the farm also transported rural populations to larger towns and cities to buy more of their, the commodities that they were increasingly purchasing. Schools and community centers closed, as rural activist Alex Sim wrote in his 1988 lament, Land and Community, Christ in Canada's Countryside, I write with a sense of urgency and alarm because I fear for the future. The narrowness and insularity, the inconvenience and the backbreaking work with primitive tools are well gone, but we are losing or have already lost the large measure of autonomy, the intimacy, the sharing of work, the visiting and caring of those former days. Few of us would want to go back, but vestiges remain. On that foundation, we can build a new rural community shaped um, more and more by the people uh, who live there. Here's an example of a rural school of the kind um, 
that was disappearing and continues to disappear in rural Canada. The costs to Canada of the new economy and society have indeed been high. As Michael Perlman has argued, urbanization has come with the high costs of feeding, transporting, and caring for an urban population almost completely dependent on wage earning and commodity exchange for its survival. As a growing number of environmental historians are arguing, Intense capitalization has been highly destructive, not only for the rural people pushed out of their communities, but remaining farmers increasing integration into international markets has had dire environmental consequences as well. Farmers now, farms now consume more energy than they create as, as food. Their dependence on off-farm inputs, inputs has involved extensive monocropping and excessive pesticide and chemical fertilizer use, all of which have taken a heavy toll on the sustainability of farming ecosystems. As people moved off the marginal rural lands that uh, characterize so much of the Canadian countryside, rural places have been more easily remade as places of rampant resource extraction, zones of sacrifice where heavy industry, suburbanization, and uh, industries such as logging, pulp and paper mills, hydroelectric electric development and mining has compromised and in some case li literally destroyed millions of acres of agricultural lands. At the same time, structural trends have favored the recreation of the countryside as a place for multiple and non-agricultural purposes that meet the needs of ur urban dwellers alone, including waste disposal, military establishments, and urban recreation and play, all of which favor the emptying out of agricultural uh, places of, of rural people who used to live there. To return to Alex Sim, the rural in Canada has not only become invisible as a place for rural people, but it is a place in which local residents are marginalized. As Sim put it, changes in the city are meticulously studied, well publicized and generously subsidized. Generous, that is, by country standards. According to current perspectives, there is a passive hinterland out there, a resource to play in, hunt in, picnic in, expropriate and burden with concrete when so retired, required in the national the translate urban interest. Oxford said a resource is a stock or reserve on which one can draw when necessary. In this case, the countryside and indirectly its inhabitants are used by an industrialized urban society, not only used, but used up. The kind of political economy that defined the life, or in conclusion, sorry, the kind of political economy that defined the life and life ways of most Canadians until the mid 20th century was transformed in the post war period by the advent of widespread fossil fuel use in the hand, hands of a growing number of multinational corporations, ramping up the rates of resource extraction to rates previously unimaginable, resulting in the wide scale destruction of both rural landscapes and rural societies across the country. The kinds of small-scale landholders uh, characterized by occupational pluralism, a modest self-sufficiency, and land-based independence from landlords and employers were driven out by highly competitive global markets. Nevertheless, until the 1960s and even beyond, many rural Canadians continued to hope that the country would be willing and able to support local agricultural uh, agriculture through small-scale petty commodity production on the family farm. But what looked like nostalgia for a lost paradise just a decade ago is taking on new meaning in the, in the uh, light of climate change. Notwithstanding the rhetoric and debate surrounding the efficiency of small-scale farming in a modern global economy, people do have to eat and their food still needs to be grown somewhere. The globalization of food has become dependent on the application of cheap fuel to the production and transportation of world food supplies. We know now that the supply of fossil fuels that produces and transports food within global networks is both limited and extremely harmful to the environments that produce our food. Both of these factors will have profound influences on the global system of food production that forced out small scale producers in the late 20th century. Perhaps Alex Sim, like his American counterpart, Wendell Berry, will be vindicated in the end, after all, as local foods become a new global phenomenon. Thank you.